Chapman and I am Tridelta's fraternity president and today I have the honor of speaking with Dr. Diane Peterson, um, our first black member of Tridelta. As you have seen her in the Trident uh, numerous times, but I wanted to have the opportunity to speak to her today, hear her story, and then also talk a little bit about Tridelta when she first began as a member and then also talk about um, Tridelta today. So uh, Diane, thank you so much for joining me today. I know that um, you've taken a lot of time out of your day to meet with me, so I do appreciate that. Well, it's, it's my pleasure to chat with you today, Kimberly. Well, Diane, I thought what we would do is just start at the beginning. So it's my understanding that you grew up on the East Coast, and then you decided to go to the University of Ohio, or Ohio Wesleyan University um, in 1962, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. So the, the decision to go there um, was sort of determined for me because I grew up in New Jersey, and New Jersey didn't have many institutions of higher learning that admitted women. There was Rutgers College, the counterpart was um, Douglas Teachers College. We had Princeton, of course, but it wasn't open to women. Um, we had New Jersey Teachers College, um, which was a part of the state university also. So most of my friends were looking to points west to go to college and Ohio has lots of choices in really good land grant colleges. So that's how I ended up at Ohio Wesleyan and it was a really good fit for me. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit about um, the United States during that time and being on campus at Ohio Wesleyan? Like what was the culture like? What was the campus like? Well, um, when I was there, I'm sort of between two generations. You've got your silent generation, and then you've got your baby boomers. And so I'm at the tail end of one and the beginning of another. It was really a time of transitioning. So you have the people in the 50s who were very accepting of the status quo, who um, were very conservative. But there was a feeling on campus that things were kind of changing, that people wanted to be a little more open, that they questioned authority a little bit more and um, were more thoughtful about their choices rather than things just being automatic. The um, civil rights movement was just getting started in the country and um, there were movements on campuses in the South to try to integrate usually it was integration with one individual or a few individuals who um, faced a lot of turmoil at that time and sometimes they had to be escorted to campus with um, police officials they were taunted as they um, approached campus it was it was a very difficult time for them people were spit on they were called names um, and in Ohio, they were integrated as far as you were being admitted to college, but there were a lot of parts of college life that were still segregated, and Greeks were certainly a big part of that. Right. So it's my understanding that you met some women at, with Alpha Gamma Delta, and then you also um, met some women from some of the other groups. So can you tell me, what was your first impression of the Greek system? Um, I was really naive when I arrived on campus. I had no idea that it was going to be segregated and it was a bit shocking for me actually that um, that was such an important part of campus life and that your admittance was based on the color of your skin. Um, I was kind of an outgoing person at the time, and <laughs> I had lots of friends. And the friends in Alpha Gamma Delta really, I guess they were kind of naive too. They thought that they could just pledge me and that would be that. Mm -hmm. 
they attempted to do so and their chapter advisor indicated that um, if they felt so strongly about that, they would lose their uh, charter and would have to go local. So um, even though they sent me a bid for membership, I withdrew because I did not want to be, um, I didn't want to be involved in a problematic situation. I didn't want to cause them to lose their chapter or to cause divisiveness within the group. So I also had friends in Kappa Alpha Theta and Alpha and Kappa Kappa Gamma and Tridelt. The Tridelts, um, I, I thought I was the only one who read what, say, the mission statement was of Tridelta, but I was talking with um, some of the gals who were in the chapter when I was there, and they were pretty popular on campus, and they could have had their choice of sorority, but they chose Tridelta because they thought that the concept of kindness to all was a wonderful um, value to have and that the other sororities lacked that. So they believed it and um, chose Dry Delta. And I felt that um, I was joining a group where the gals really um, cherished their values, lived by them and even though I had trouble joining Alpha Gamma Delta, they assured me that there wasn't anything that would block my uh, membership or being initiated into Tri Delta at the time. And we know that that became a problem. I mean, and that is something I want to talk to you about today, just because that you weren't just faced with kind of light to all, you were faced with opposition. Would you like to talk about that a little bit? Sure. So um, I think all of us had a different experience with sorority life because we were kind of cheated out of a year. The gals in the chapter, particularly the officers, spent a lot of time finding documents, filling out forms. The, um, the officers um, from National gave them lots of work to do. And rather than um, enjoying the sorority membership and what you get out of that or enjoying campus life, they were responding to some of these queries. The um, women descended upon our chapter almost immediately upon getting word that I had pledged. And I have to say, I'm gonna just divert a little bit here. So there were three things that were required of membership. And I've always been astounded that they were able to find someone who knew me in my hometown to recommend me. I, I thought that was an exceptional thing that they accomplished. And the other thing that they accomplished was they were able to find or recruit a chapter advisor who would sign off on my membership. That was what had pre prevented other black women from joining sororities in the past is that they could get the reference, they could get the 100% vote of the chapter, but the alumni advisor would not sign off on it. But the women who came to Delaware, Ohio, used um, intimidation, they used threats, they made the chapter go through a lot of um, petty paperwork, let's just put it that way, so that they could put them on probation. They made um, them live up to requirements that previous um, chapters, I don't really mean chapters, but previous um, classes right. had not had to live up to. And um, so they made the group that was in the chapter at this time fully responsible for all these infractions that had occurred maybe 10 years ago. So we were on probation for, I don't know, maybe you know the period of time better than I do, but it was for at least a year. And if you're on probation, you can't um, participate in fraternity activities such as initiation. Oh, okay. 
So, so that's how they were attempting to block your initiation. Exactly. Was by putting them putting your chapter on probation, and then you cannot. Would they allow other members to go through initiation, or just the whole? No, no. It was the the entire class that I was a part of. That you're a part of. Yeah. So then they lifted the probation. I'm assuming, and you were able to be initiated, or did they initiate you with? And instead, did your chapter just go ahead and initiate you? Oh you no, 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 no. They were go they were following all the rules. Trust me, okay. they followed every single rule. So. Um, actually, the national um, office was contacted by the president of Ohio Wesleyan, okay. and he insisted that someone from national come directly to campus and speak with him about what was going on in our chapter. And he wanted an assurance from, I think it was the collegiate vice president who came down. Okay. Um, he wanted assurance from her that I would be in fact, initiated. And he also issued a letter to all the other Greek groups on campus at that time, demanding that within a certain date that there be um, evidence from every chapter that they had nothing discriminatory uh, in their charters or their constitutions or whatever written documents they had. And I, I'm very proud of him for doing that. I'm also very proud of your advisors, your advisor who stood up. And I'm also very proud of the Delta Upsilon chapter for standing up for you. But mostly I'm very proud of you. I, I, I've heard your story of reading it and I just can't imagine, I can't imagine the fraternity that I know that is supposed to be kind of like to all doing this to another human being, doing this to a woman. Um, and I can't imagine, but at the same time, we know that racism still exists today, which I do want to talk about in a little bit, but I want to finish your story of becoming initiated. So tell me a little bit about that. Tell me about that experience. So, um, because it was such a struggle, and I think because the girls were so steadfast in their views, and I still choke up thinking about what they did, yeah. because I think they were so remarkable. Um, it was such a happy and joyful day for all of us because we felt as though we had maybe the only real sisterhood in the entire country. Absolutely. We, Absolutely. Knew we, had, we knew it was the only one on campus, but we, and I know that they felt so proud of what they did and that they felt that they had won an incredible victory that right won out because they stuck to their guns. They were not intimidated. They did not back down. They knew what was right. They had clarity of purpose. And um, many of them have shared with me what that meant in their lives afterward. Absolutely. And while they were cheated out of a year of um, their sisterhood and their fellowship, I think they emerged stronger. I think many of them um, emerged as leaders who might not have chosen that path. And one friend always tells me stories about her life after Tri Delta and how she has um, had a better idea of sometimes what it's like to face prejudice, yeah. but to have the strength um, and the um, and the and the will to stand up against it whenever she sees it and. Um, We've been friends for more than 50 years now. It's, it's a wonderful friendship. The, our ritual says um, with the true power is when you have one life influencing another. And I think of that time that you went through, that your pledge sisters and your chapter sisters all to rally and to stand up to such injustice and such cruelty. Um, I mean, that's the truth, like you said, you probably did have the strongest chapter, the strongest sisterhood, because you were living the true meaning of what Tri-Delta is. 
being kind, being brave, and standing up for somebody that you love and you believe in. Um, I don't know if you ever received, if you ever spoke to anybody in the national office. Did anybody contact you directly? Um, I don't recall. I think that no one really contacted me. I think I did meet the um, collegiate vice president when she came to the house, but it wasn't as though she was approaching me individually or singling me out. I think I was just in the room at the time and met her. I'm sure she um, wanted to meet me, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Who is this girl? Well, I just want to say, I don't know if you've ever received an apology. And I know that I was not there during the time, but I have the opportunity now as your fraternity president to formally apologize for that time. Um, I can't imagine what you went through and I'm so very sorry that the fraternity that we both love would ever cause you harm or um, your, your chapter harm. Delta Upsilon has a very, um, they're very strong women. And so I apologize to all of your pledge sisters and your chapter sisters too. Well, thank you for that. Cause I feel like we were all in it together. And I feel as though they went through an awful lot as well. So thank you very much, Kimberly. You're welcome. Well, let's talk about your journey after Tri Delta. What have you been up to? Well, um, <laughs> it's been a, a lot. lot of years. <laughs> Um, actually, I um, went to graduate school. I studied communicative disorders. I was a speech pathologist for a period of time. And I've always been the kind of person who looks ahead to the future. And I think, well, what do I want to be doing in 10 years, even though I enjoy what I'm doing now? So my uh, future 10 year decision was I don't think I want to continue being a speech pathologist and my options were get a PhD or medical school. So I chose medical school and I um, was lucky enough again because you could really face serious discrimination as a woman going into medicine. Yes. But I lucked out, I got some really good advice and I went to a school that welcomed women and we had a higher percentage than any other um, medical school in the country of women and also older people. So even though um, I was in my early 30s, there were people there who were older than I was. Um, and I decided to be a surgeon. So I became a head and neck surgeon. And what was marvelous too, was that the surgeons were very welcoming to women. If you were interested in their field, they were so happy you were there. Um, it was pretty incredible. So uh, I was introduced to a different kind of mentoring in medical school um, by women, which was wonderful. Um, so I worked for 28 years as a head and neck surgeon doing pretty much much general, um, it's called otolaryngology. It's like ear, nose, and throat surgery, but it has a medical aspect to it too. So you can really develop relationships with patients, which I really liked. So a good part of my practice was working with um, children. Mm -hmm. um, I had lots of young patients who had either ear disease or sleep problems or tonsil problems or that sort of thing. So um, I would say maybe a quarter of my practice was pediatrics, which I totally enjoyed. But um, I loved my practice, but now I'm retired and I've been retired since 2015. Congratulations I, on that. Thank you. And I just love traveling, seeing the world, learning about other people in other places. Well, that, I think it's a well-deserved retirement, and I hope you have a good time traveling. Well, I wanted you. to ask you today a little bit about Tri Delta today. I know you're on in the Trident, and then we've also um, 
been having some messaging that's gone out um, due to all the racial racial injustice that's been mm -hmm. happening this summer from George Floyd to Breonna Taylor. I just think um, we want to make sure that we as the executive board and also the fraternity, this is going to be a huge growth, not only for our Tri Delta, our country, but also like us individually. Have you um, had a chance to at all like uh, to look at any of our statements or we have a business resolution that's coming up. I wanted to talk to you about that and just get your thoughts on that, on those things that we put out this summer. Well, um, I think they all sound good. There, there are lots of words that were sort of paired like listen and learn. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was sort of, it felt like there were some very direct semantics, like it was very carefully put together. And um, I probably read it maybe like three times, just sort of appreciating the, the word choice, um, like uh, condemn and confront the, uh, the biases that we face. Um, and I like your three pillars of being brave, bold, and kind, and, and what goes into each of those categories. I think your business plan is a good one because one of the problems from um, all levels of leadership, it doesn't feel to me when I look in the Trident or see representation from Tri-Delta that there are any uh, faces of color in positions of leadership. Right. And I think that's, that's one of the things that's uh, been missing. But I particularly like um, your plans to have um, discussions and to provide materials to the collegiates and to the um, members who are alumni. I think it, it's good that both groups are going to be um, included. And, and just this conversation today, when we're able to face our past and the mistakes that we've made and own up to them in this way, I think then um, we're better able to move forward to recognize um, what we've done to evaluate where we are and, and how to move forward from here. So um, you need self-examination in order to change. And I think that's important. Absolutely. As we started to navigate through um, this important work, we wanted the executive board started to talk to stakeholders within our organization, outside of our organization, our mentors, our advisors, and then strangers, just to get a feel for what do we need to be doing to be able to address this uh, important work. Part of it is our business resolution to recognize our past that we were founded to be kind of left all, but we worked on things, but we have one short on many things too, because there is still racism within our organization. When we came out and said that there is no place for racism in Tri-Delta, we did get feedback. And I would say we got feedback that was, you know, people told stories that you had just said to me. And um, there were people that saw things happen within the organization. And then we have that some people that feel that there is no racism in Tri-Delta. And I, I have seen as the fraternity president, as executive board member, all of it, not, but at the same time, I know that everybody's experience is so different. Do you believe that there's anything that we are doing that you see as racism within the organization? Or allows My ex what? Go ahead. Allows racism. You just mentioned a little bit about the trident. Right. So um, I've seen over maybe the last five years more of an effort to uh, print stories about um, inclusion, to show photos of chapters where there are a significant number of um, faces that are not white. Um, 
I'm not involved enough with the organization to, to fully understand um, up the channels of leadership what, um, what needs to change or what could change. Um, I think we don't all recognize when we are engaging in racist activities. I, um, in, in recent weeks, have read articles and um, have purchased some books that I'm delving into. But there was one a faculty member from Wellesley who tasked herself with listing at least 50 ways in which she felt that she was privileged by virtue of the color of her skin, mm -hmm. not by virtue of where she lived or her socioeconomic level. And it was interesting for me to go through that list and say, oh yeah, let me circle this. That's something that I've experienced. When I moved into a neighborhood, um, how are my neighbors going to feel about me because I'm the only black person in this neighborhood? Or when I go into Neiman Marcus, um, is there somebody shadowing me, you know, concerned about if I have the financial means to be shopping here or if I'm going, or if I'm on a different agenda? Anyway, I don't want to belabor that point, but um, I think if we all took the time to do an exercise like that. It's, it's worth doing. And a friend of mine um, pointed out to me that when she befriended um, a, a black woman, it sounds bad, but she's white, she, she had a black friend and they would go to the grocery store together and sometimes they would exchange children. So when she had the black child in her cart, she had a very different experience than when she had her own child in the cart. And um, I think her, her feeling was that if we put ourselves in positions where maybe we experience what um, a non-white person might experience, it gives you a whole different sort of outlook for that. I think this time I, I've been reading a lot too because you you try your hardest, you try to be kind and you try to be educated, but then at the same time, there's a lot of things that I realized inadvertently that I was doing that I didn't realize I was doing that could be a microaggression or could be hurtful to somebody else, even though I thought I was coming from a place with a good heart. And that's what I've really felt taking this time while the country's going through it, while Tri Delta's going through it, um, to really make sure that I understand because I can only understand if my heart is open and mm -hmm. I'm listening. And the, so you did hear those words in uh, our lead now plan is we do want to listen. We want to be open and, and hear other people's thoughts and amplify those voices. One of the ways that we want to do that is by bringing um, two people of color, two of our members, Tri Delta's members, onto the executive board. Um, doing this work, and you have to have people's voices at the highest level if we're going to set the strategic vision of the organization, and um, not just on, on race, but on finances, on programming. Executive board looks at mental health um, programming, hazing, anti-hazing programming, all of that that affects our whole entire organization needs to have everyone's voices in it in order to create change. What are your thoughts on us adding two board members of color onto our executive board? Well, I think that's an excellent idea. I think that's a good start. Um, I, um, I'm very encouraged by it. And I did reach out to some other uh, Tri-Deltas that live near me and um, they were also very encouraged and 
thought that it's a good starting place. Right. So. Start is the key word because I talked to Megan, our um, new fraternity president, who will start in August, and this isn't going to be something um, that Tri Delta is going to do for a moment. This is not just August of 2020. This has to be a journey that we all need to go through in order to be able to truly be kind of like to all. And I think that you hopefully will see that reflected in the Trident social media, but then also in all of our programming and who we are as an organization. Um, so in terms of other positions like chapter development consultants, that sort of thing, how, how do you see that uh, changing in the future? So we, uh, in the past couple of years, that has been something that we have been very intentional uh, with, is having our CDCs, our chapter development uh, consultants, reflect our collegiate chapters. We have had people of color um, as, as CDCs, and I will see, I would imagine we would continue to do that also. But beyond that, I think it needs, we need to make sure that we're addressing this in our volunteers, in our alumni advisors, our collegiate district officers, our coordinators. Um, we're going to have a diversity, equity, inclusion um, committee and see how that could go, how they could affect the training of our volunteers also. And then we have other boards. And I do also think that our other boards will start to reflect to have people of color on them too. Um, it's important. We have to have all of our members' voices represented throughout the organization in order to truly be tri um, To truly reflect all of our voices, we have to be throughout. So I think you will see change there too. Okay, well that sounds very encouraging. Well, Diane, I um, just appreciate you so much for taking the time to talk with me today and being honest and sharing your story. Uh, again, I am just so grateful that you said yes to Tri Delta. I'm so grateful that your um, chapter member said yes to you and stood up for that and knew what that meant at that time and know, know what that means today, too. Um, I am just so I'm proud that you're my sister and I am proud of that you said yes and you're saying yes to us today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kimberly. Thanks a lot. Will you take care?